Streaming and serving Anna Fayetteville, Georgia, you are listening to the New Vision Church podcast, a community to belong, be loved, and believe. Let's check out today's message. And I think that's an important question for us to ask. What are we going to do? What are you going to do to change that? And, and by the way, this video is dated. This is like 10 years old. There's, there's another billion people in the world since this video was made. Another billion people. And so when we, can, when we consider that, right, and these numbers are really staggering, and we think about, oh, you know, we feel like, oh, we're doing so much for missions. Well, really, we're not doing that much for people who haven't gotten the gospel. We might be doing a lot that looks missionary, but it's not really reaching people who don't have the gospel. And so it's important for us to be prayerfully considering, what is it, God, that you want me to do personally? I know many of us, and and, and our church is a very giving church, and and we do a lot of cross-cultural experiences, mission trips every year uh, to several places. We just got back from India. We, We are looking at going to El Salvador and Honduras this summer. We're looking at going Kenya in the fall. And, and this is what I, I need for us to understand, is that it's going to take more than just a couple of us. It's going to take all of us to accomplish God's mission for the world. And so I want to ask you, what are you doing about that? For the last couple of weeks, we've been focusing a lot on missions, and this is to not just raise awareness, but hopefully to raise up other missionaries, hopefully to raise up other people who, who want to go and who want to serve and who want to give their lives to the cause of Christ. And as the skit that, that the kids did this morning, right, we need to understand that being a missionary doesn't mean you have to go somewhere else. It, it, you just have to have a mission to be a missionary. And so if you're living this morning without purpose, if you're living this morning, you feel like, oh, you know, I just don't, you know, my life just seems meaningless. Then, then let me tell you, you don't have a mission yet. You don't understand that God has a mission and purpose for you. And that even though you might be going to a job that you don't like and you're dealing with people that are very hard for you to uh, sometimes deal with, that's your mission field. That's your mission field. So often, people are trying to get away from maybe people that God are trying to take you to. Like Jonah. Okay? Jonah didn't want to go. Jonah was like, I don't care if those people die. Jonah was like, go ahead and send down fire on them, God. And God was like, Jonah, I care about those people. And Jonah's like, I don't. And God said, that's why you're going, (laughs) right? You see, God's more interested in changing your heart sometimes. We feel like, oh, God, you got to change them. And by the way, let me just say this. And we all have people that we have to deal with that sometimes are hard for us to love. But so are you. You're hard to love, okay? Don't don't just point the finger. Y'all know what they say about pointing your finger, right? You got three fingers pointing right back at you. So a lot of times when we're pointing the finger at somebody else saying, oh, the problem is you, the problem is you. No, maybe the problem is you. That you've got to be willing to change. You've got to allow God to change you. And if God changes you, everybody's going to see that around you. And they're going to say, there's something different about you. What's going on? And, and all of a sudden, that's an open door for you to share. Well, it's not me. It's God in me. I can't change myself. But God can change you. He can give you a new mission, a new outlook on life, and everything about you can now point to Jesus. But did you know that the word missionary is not even in the Bible? Did you know that? Some people get thrown off by that. You know, why? Well, then why are you using it? Well, let me me give you this information. That the actual word missionary is from the Latin word missio, which means sending. And the Greek word apostello means messenger. And so you'll see the word apostello. Sometimes in the Bible, you'll see the word apostles, okay? Jesus took his disciples, and he then called them apostles, okay? And so the disciples became apostles because they were people being sent out. Jesus sent them out. And he said, I want you to go and do the same things I've been doing. Go and, and heal people. Go and talk to people, right? Go and pray for people. Go and do this. He was sending them out. And so this morning... Even though the word missionary is not in the Bible, that is what you are. You're a person on mission. You're a person who is being sent out. You're a person that that God has given different gifts, abilities, and talents, and skills so that others might come to Christ. So when we're talking about missions, it's more than just a concept of of this, this idea that somebody else needs to go and do that. 
No, we need to look at it as this is the task that God has given me. If I'm a member of his church, if I'm a member of his body, and, and I'm a disciple of Jesus, then Jesus is sending you. Jesus is calling you. John 20, 21, look at that. Jesus said to them again. Now, he's talking specifically to the 12 disciples that he had. But he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. So Jesus is talking directly to his disciples here, and he says, look, God sent me, and he sent me to you, and now that you've heard the message, now I'm sending you to others. Very famous verse on missions. Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Another very pertinent verse, especially around missions, Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So who is the you in these passages? Well, we know that Jesus is talking specifically to his disciples who are right then and there. But if we hold to the Bible, if we hold to the New Testament, this you is you. It's not just his disciples. When Jesus left in Matthew 28 and he's ascending to heaven, he's telling all the disciples and he says, you go, you go. And how many times have I heard that there are some people in, in churches who feel like, oh, well, you know, that doesn't apply to me. Why? Why doesn't it apply to you? What, what, what makes you so special that God's word doesn't apply to you? When Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, how does that not apply to you? Oh, well, I don't have that gift. I don't have that calling. Look, there are some people who have been given special gifts, abilities, talents. Maybe they can speak languages really well. You know, I, I'm so grateful there, is, there are people who can interpret. Every time I go to El Salvador, you know, they're like, have you learned any Spanish yet? I'm like, nada. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It can, they ask me every time, have you learned any Spanish? Nope. And I tell them, I'm not learning Spanish because I'm trying to keep you employed. I need an interpreter, <laughs> right? And, and so I'm so grateful there are people who have the gift of languages that they can just learn language and man and interpret for us. And so don't feel like, oh, I don't know that language. You don't need to know that language. God's already got people there who do. All right? And so there's all these excuses people make up. You know, I don't, I, I don't know if I'm going to like the food. Listen, I've been to countries where I wasn't quite sure about the food. Today, you're going to get to try some of it. <laughs> I had to eat it. I want you to eat it. <laughs> and so after the service today, we're inviting you to stay for some international cuisine. We want you to try some things from different places. I promise you it's all going to be good. But there is some kimchi, and it's going to be a little spicy. So, you know, um, be prepared uh, for that. But, but, but this is what we've got to understand is that everywhere we go, I was in India this time, and, and if my mom was here, she would tell you, I don't eat spicy stuff. But this time in India, this was my fourth time in India, um, they weren't holding back on the spices like they used to. <laughs> they were like, you're here, you're going to eat our food. And I was, they took us to a place, and I'm telling you, I was eating stuff, and I had tears in my eyes. Because <laughs> I don't eat hot stuff. But, you know, God gave me grace to get through it. And, and, and you may feel like, you know, I don't know about the food. Listen, everywhere I've been, there's stuff that I can eat. You see, you always feel like, well, I can't eat everything. You can eat something there. I promise you, every place got eggs. You can eat eggs. Even if you lack toast, they got bread. You can eat toast, right? And so we make all these excuses and say, well, I can't do this. I can't do that. What can you do? Tell me what you can do. You know what I mean? Everybody's like, oh, I can't do that. Well, can you do anything? Can you breathe? Okay, it's the same oxygen there. In fact, in some places, it's better than here, Right? And so sometimes we're making all these excuses as to why we can't do something. And God's like, did I tell you to go? Because this is what we've got to remember, that if God has told you to do it, then he will equip you to do it. But this is the problem, is that sometimes we're saying, well, God, I don't want you to equip me. I don't want you to make me ready. I'm good with where I'm at. And what we've got to pray is that God would change our hearts, that God would change our vision, that we would be able to see things the way that God sees things. 
And see, that was Jonah's problem, is that Jonah didn't want to see people the way that God saw people. Jonah didn't care. And what we've got to understand is this, is that if you are a Christian and you are a follower of Jesus, God expects you to care about the things that he cares about. And he cares about people. And so if you have a problem caring about people, and I'm saying this all people, because sometimes we just want to care about the people that we like, the people who are like us. Listen, I've been in places, and it's, it's uh, yeah, it's hot. And things have changed for me. I like the heat now. That's why y'all hear me all the time. I walk in here, and I'm like, man, it's cold in here. What's wrong with y'all? It's cold in here. In fact, the heaters are on right now. But, but sometimes, right, we, we are so accustomed to our comforts. Do you know there are people who are walking miles to go to church this morning? We, got, we have people, when we move from our old location, and by the way, that's where our new building it is. It's in our old location. But when we move from the old location, it's only five miles. And there were some people who were like, that's too far for me to go. And I'm like, really? Too far? And we've got, but there are people that, that walk miles to come to church, and they don't walk in comfortable shoes. Some of them walking barefooted. There are kids, right? I've seen them in, in Nigeria that they don't have their own desk. They don't have their own tables. they got to bring them from home. So you're not, just, you're not just walking to school. You're carrying your desk and your chair to school with you. Miles. That when we, we would bring over in the early days, we were just bringing like small gifts, you know, because you got to be careful. You can't, you can't pack all the stuff you want to pack to bring to people. But we were bringing gifts to give to the, the children in school when we gave them a number two pencil. When we, they would get that pencil, they're standing in line, they take that pencil and they say, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. If we gave out a number two pencil to a kid today in America, you know, they're going to laugh at you. They're going to throw it back in your face and say, what is this? It'll be broken in five seconds. And these kids in Nigeria, they had pencils that were down to the nub, and they're using them. You see, sometimes we just don't understand how good we've got it. And what we need to understand is this, is that you got to ask your question, yourself that question. What is my mission and purpose in life? Is it just to get more and more and more for myself, or am I here so that God can do more and more through me? But I want you to understand this too, is that if you don't want to be used by God, God will use someone else. God doesn't have to use you. God chooses to use you. God wants to use you, but you've got to be available to him. And if you're filling your schedule and you're doing all these kind of things, getting yourself in tons of debt where you can't go and do something, right? And I've been there too. I've had lots of debt. Praise God. I've been able to, to work on that. But, but what we've got to understand is this, right, is that sometimes we are tethering ourselves to things that aren't going to matter. You're tying yourself down to a bunch of stuff that you think is going to matter in 15 or 20 years, and I promise you, whenever you get older, you're not going to care about all that stuff. And your kids ain't going to care about it either. They're going to look at it just like I'm looking at some of the stuff. You know, i got my dad and his wife in, in North Carolina, and we're, we're getting ready to transition some stuff. And I'm just like, what, what are we going to do with all this stuff? Right? And everything that he's had and accumulated, and I look at all the stuff I've had and accumulated, and I'm like, where's the dumpster? Because that's where, that's where a lot of us going to go. And so all this stuff, right, that we spend all of our time accumulating, and we think, oh, you know, this is what makes me feel good. This is what makes me feel successful. This is what makes me feel like, well, I'm working for something. You're working for something that's going to go away in, in five or ten years. Or you can invest in something that will never go away. And see, so it's a, it's a different mentality. We have to start thinking differently. If we think differently, we will live differently. And if we live differently, we can actually make a difference. But I've said this before, that if you want to be different, or if you, want to, if you want to make a difference, you have to be different. And a lot of people say, oh, I want to make a difference. Well, are you doing anything different? You're doing the same thing everybody else is doing. You're getting up every morning, and you go, and you get in your line, you go get your coffee, you go to work, and you, and, and you, you do nothing. You're working for, for somebody doing nothing. And, and it's like, why not intentionally go to work and say, this is my mission field? 
And so everything I'm going to do, I'm going to do intentionally. And I'm not just going to get coffee for myself. I'm going to get coffee for that person that really irks me. <laughs> right? And I'm going, to, I'm going to start serving and, and showing them the love of God so that I can tell them about the love of God. And so often we get it in reverse, right? We're trying to tell people about Jesus, tell people about Jesus when their ears are closed because their hearts are hard. And their hearts are hard because they haven't experienced the love of God. Maybe that's the very reason why you're there. Philippians 3.20, look at what it says. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I was born in Okinawa, Japan. And I really wish that I had more proof of that. <laughs> it is on my passport. I guess that's proof enough. So I was born in Okinawa, Japan, because I was an army baby, right? And my mother is from Korea, as many of you know. And my citizenship, though, officially on Earth, is the U.S. But when I go places and when I fill out documents and it says, where were you born? I have to put Japan. And people don't believe me when I tell them I was born in Japan. And I'm like, I was. I'm sorry if you don't believe me. That's where I was born. But that's not where my citizenship was. My citizenship is here. And what we need to understand is that we're, we're born again if you're a follower of Jesus. And even though you might live here, your citizenship is not here. Your citizenship is heaven. And so you need to start operating, you need to start acting, you need to start dressing, you need to start talking like someone who's from heaven, who's got a different outlook on life, that you look different, you live different, you act different. In my mom's house, look, she's Korean. When I go to her house, your shoes come off. You say, well, I ain't Korean. She's like, but I am. <laughs> Whose house is it, <laughs> Right? And a lot of times, right, we're trying, to, we're trying to bring our culture in. And what we've got to understand is this. is like, look, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have a certain way of living. It doesn't matter where you are. Some people want to turn it off when they go on vacation. Does Sunday still happen on vacation? I think it does. But a lot of people won't go to church on vacation. Why not? You're not taking a vacation from God. You're not taking a vacation from Jesus. Why is it that we feel like we're going on vacation? I'm not going to do everything I used to do at home. You should be still doing the same things. You should still be reading your Bible, having your devotion, going to church. You should still do those things. When I go on vacation, I don't really go on vacation, but when I'm out of town, I still go to church. This past week, I was in North Carolina. I went to church on Wednesday night. Would y'all expect anything different? Oh, you're the pastor. Well, yeah, but I still make decisions. And so this is what you've got to understand. It doesn't matter. I'm not doing it just because I'm the pastor. I'm doing it because my citizenship is in heaven. And so what we've got to understand is this, is that regardless of where you are, you've got to act like you're a citizen of that country. Therefore, as ambassadors of Christ, for Christ, God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Look at what he says you are, 2 Corinthians 5.20. You are an ambassador. We have ambassadors in different countries, and they have the, the distinct job of representing our country there. And these ambassadors are people that, you know, you hope you can respect. They've been given a very, very important task of representing the U.S. to the rest of the world, or specifically to that part of the world. And so if God is saying you're an ambassador, you have a very specific task of representing Jesus to whatever part of the world you're living in. That, that whether it's in Jonesboro or Riverdale or Fayetteville, you're supposed to be an ambassador in that place. Your place of work. God has specifically, and by the way, you say, oh, well, I got my job. No, God gave you that job. God allowed you to get it, <laughs> right? So many times we think, oh, you know, I'm doing all this. No, it's God allowing you to do it. Because your health could be gone just like that. Your life could change just like that. So we've got to understand, right? Everything that's happening, God is allowing to happen. And he's allowing it to happen so that we might be vessels for him to use. And so we are supposed to be ambassadors for Christ. And look at what it says. God making his appeal through us. Are you making Jesus appealing to others? Would, would others come around you and say, man, I want to hear about your God? 
I, I, I hear that you live a little differently. I hear that there are certain things that you do or practice in your life. Tell me why do you do that? You know, we, uh, we, this, this next week is called Holy Week. And during Holy Week, there's a lot of things that, that go on. You know, in our church for several years, we didn't practice a Monday, Thursday service. Some of y'all still like, what's, what's that? Well, Monday, Thursday is the Thursday before Good Friday. And, and we celebrate that day in particular because that's the last meal that Jesus had with his disciples. And so on Monday, Thursday, we'll have a special communion service here at the church um, at 630. Just to commemorate, these were the last hours of Jesus' life. And so we, we want to celebrate, right, all that Jesus has done for us. But to appreciate some of these things, right, we, we, we take these holy moments so that we can put ourselves in those positions to just think and contemplate and say, thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me. And so this week, right, we're going to gather on Wednesday to help fill Easter eggs for our Easter egg hunt. We're, uh, Thursday, we're going to have our Monday Thursday service with, with communion. Then we're going to have a Good Friday service. And I'm going to encourage you to, to come because the Good Friday service, listen, you know, we, we think we understand what Jesus went through, but you can't fully comprehend all that Jesus suffered for, for us. And so we're going to take some time on Friday to, to go through some of that and explain it. And then on Saturday, right? Saturday, in the Scriptures, nothing happens on Saturday, at least not physically. It seems like there's silence, that God has just been gone silent. But this is what we don't understand about, about the silence of God is that even when God is silent, he's still working. Maybe you need to hear that this morning. And some of y'all are like, I haven't heard from God in a while. I don't know what God, look, God is still working. God's still doing things behind the scenes. And so even though Jesus was, his body was in the tomb, but he was still alive. He was still alive and he was still doing things. And so what we've got to understand is that all this builds up to next Sunday, which is Resurrection Sunday. And, and I want to encourage you that if you can be part of the things that are going on this holy week, that you would do that. But let's look back at Acts 1-8 real quick, right? He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What we need to understand is why Jesus is saying this to his disciples. And, and here's, a, here's a map that kind of depicts what he's talking about. Jesus is talking to his disciples here, and he says, well, you're going to start in Jerusalem because that's where you are physically. Start where you are. It's really hard for some people to understand why you want to be a missionary around the world. And listen, every time we, we take mission trips, people are like, well, there's stuff here in America you could be doing. And there is. But I want you to understand this. It's a lot easier for people to send you on a mission to another country when you're doing something already here. And so if you, want God to, if you want others to support your work for God around the world, then start doing something here. Start where you are. And we've got a lot of local missions, a lot of things that you can do to plug in and serve other people in our area. So you start in Jerusalem. Then he said you're going to spread out to Judea. And the gospel did. It moved to Judea and then up to Samaria. And, and if you know anything about the Samaritans, the Jews hated the Samaritans. And so what's, what's Jesus saying? He's saying this, you're going to take the gospel even to places that are uncomfortable for you. You're going to take the gospel to people that maybe you don't even like, but I'm going to change your heart because the fact of the matter is this, is that God's word and what Jesus did is for the entire world. It's for everybody. And so he says, and then you're eventually going to end up to the, to the ends of the earth. And back in those days, right, the ends of the earth was, they, they really couldn't even comprehend the ends of the earth. We were in India. Do you know which disciple took the gospel to India? It was Thomas. What do we know about Thomas? He was the doubter. God took the doubter to a place where they needed the gospel. And so you might be here saying, well, I don't know about Jesus. I don't know if God could use me. Oh, if he used a doubter, he can use you. And by the way, if you look at Matthew 28, I think it's verse like 16 or 17, it says that the, the disciples had gathered to worship him. And then there's this little phrase and it says, and some doubted. They were worshiping and they still doubted. And so you might be here today worshiping, but you still got some doubts. You still don't know how, understand all this Jesus stuff. Well, that's okay. That's okay. God can still work in your life too. 
And Jesus and God took a doubter to a place like India that the gospel might be proclaimed. And so if you're taking notes this morning, if you're using the Bible app this morning, I want you to understand it's not a when and then, but an in and an and. It's not a when and then. So many people are like, oh, you know, I, 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 I'll, I'll go when I can. I'll go when I retire. I'll go when. Listen, you need to be going now. That may not mean around the world. It might just mean across the street. It might just mean to your coworker. Jesus said this. He said, go in Jerusalem and then in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the world. You see, Jesus wants you to start where you are. In those specific places, in your hometown, in your neighborhood, in your job, in your family, start there. And see what you can do elsewhere. You can can pray for every other country. You can do that. I, I want you to know, if we're honest, most of our prayers are very selfish. Most of our prayers are for the things that we want. Maybe this week, take some time and change your prayer life a little bit. And begin to pray for the missionaries around the world. Begin to pray for the people who don't have the gospel. Begin to pray that God would send people, raise up people to go, and then begin to pray that God, if I'm one of those people, change my heart, that I might accomplish your mission. Start where you are, but pray, and I'll go. I'm going to start right here in Jonesboro, in Riverdale, in Fayetteville, but I'm also going to make a difference in places like El Salvador and Lebanon and India and these places. And you can do that by praying. You can do that by giving a little bit of extra cash. You can do that by going. So whatever it is that the Lord is calling you to do, let me encourage you, start where you are, but be open to God using you in other ways. And then I have this other word highlighted, witnesses. He says, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and to the uttermost parts of the world, right? But if you remember Matthew 28, what did Jesus say? He said, I will be with you to the end of of the age. And I always kind of scratch my head when I heard that because I'm just like, Jesus, you're talking about going to be missionaries, being missionaries, and then all of a sudden you kind of wrap it up real quick by saying, I'll be with you. Why does he say that? Maybe because there will be times when your confidence is going to be low. Maybe there will be times when your faith is going to be low. Maybe there are going to be times when you're going on these trips, you're preparing for these trips, and you feel like, I just don't know that I've got it, God. And he says, well, you got me. What else do you need? You see, our witness is based on his with us. It's not just a witness, it's a with us. And Jesus is saying, you got me. I got you. That's all you need. What more do you need? So he says, I've commanded you. I've commanded you. I said this last week. This is an area where many people are disobedient to Jesus. That he's trying to send us. He's trying to get the message out. And so many people are disobedient. That they don't send. They don't go. They don't give. They don't pray. And so Jesus says, behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. You see, when we go, we're not going alone. I've been on a few trips by myself. I don't mind going but I also understand this. I'm not going by myself, right? You, you may feel like sometimes, right, even just going to the hospital for a visit or going to your neighbor next door, right, you feel like you're going by yourself, but you're not going by yourself. God's got you. He's with you, and he promises to never leave you. You see, when we go as witnesses, we're going to give witness to what he's already doing. God is already moving. He's doing stuff, right, without you. But he's sending you that you might point others to what he's doing. That's what a witness is, right? When I see an accident and the police comes up, they're just asking you, what what did you see happen? You're, You're just saying, this is what I saw. 
This is what, this is what happened. And so when you go to another country and, and you're just there, what you're doing, and listen to this, by the way, you could be the answer to somebody's prayer. When we took, when I went to uh, Nigeria the first time, we took a lot of different supplies, like I was telling you, and um, we, we brought some choir robes that had been donated from another uh, church. And uh, when we got there, you know, and, and of course, when you're traveling with these things, it's bulky, it's hard, you know, you, 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 you got to carry all this stuff, move it from one place to another to another, and it took several hours to get it to the village of Ututu where we were staying. And uh, when we got it there after several days, um, we were going to distribute these to the church. And so we brought them up to the church and um, started distributing them, and they just started crying. And they said, we've been praying for choir robes. We had no idea. And here's the amazing part. It's had exactly the number they needed. Right? You see, sometimes we don't understand that you could be the answer to somebody's prayer, and you don't even know they're praying for you. And you're, you're fighting, going, and going, and God is like, listen, I'm trying to help you be the answer to somebody's prayer. Would you just go? Would you just give? Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down to Jerusalem from, to Gaza. This is a desert place. Oh, that doesn't sound too fun. I, I don't want to go to a desert place, right? But, but look, Philip, who was a disciple of Jesus, had a thriving ministry. Everything was going great. And all of a sudden, now the Spirit, Holy Spirit comes and says, Philip, get up and go from that place where your ministry's thriving and go to this place where nothing seems to be happening. Get up and go to Gaza, to this desert place. And so what did Philip do? He rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. You see, God was already working. Philip didn't know it. God was already working in this Ethiopian eunuch. This eunuch had come to Jerusalem to worship, and while he's there, he's reading, and he leaves, he's still reading, and he still has these questions, and now God has sent Philip to him. And so when, it, when the Spirit says, go and join this chariot, Philip just kind of, I'll go. I'm the only one out here. Uh, yeah, there ain't nobody else around. I guess it's got to be me. I'll go. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says when the Spirit said go, he got up and ran. He ran. This guy was like, okay, God, I'm here. I'm ready to go. And so God said go, and man, he was burning the trail. How many of you, if God said to you today, go, you'd be dragging your feet? How many of you today, if God said, hey, I want you to do something, you'd be like, well, you know, I, I, would, I would, God, but I got to do that. I got to do this. So Philip ran to him. And when Philip ran to him, look, Philip didn't run saying, hey, man, hey, I'm here to tell you about Jesus. I'm here to explain all No. Philip ran and he listened. He ran and listened. What does the Bible say? Be quick to hear. Slow to speak. Right? So many of us, man, you know, we just feel like, oh, everything I got to say is so important, you got to hear it. And listen, the message of Jesus is the most important message we could share. But sometimes we've got to listen for a place to insert the gospel. We've got to listen to what's going on in people's lives so that we might be able to share with them the hope that is found in him. And so Philip ran and listened, and he heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. So he just listened, and he said, where are you? What's, what? He's just kind of getting all the information. Okay, where's this guy at? What's he, what's he doing? Oh, he's reading the prophet Isaiah. And I think Philip would be like, how ironic. It seems like I'm here at the right time. And so Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? You see, sometimes we just need to lead with some questions. We're trying to lead with statements. We're trying to lead with imperatives. Maybe you need to lead with some questions. I found that asking questions gets me farther than making statements. He says, the, the, the eunuch said, how can I understand unless someone guides me? And so he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. 
you know, when we're open to God using us, you will find that the door is open more times than it's closed. You will find that people are willing to invite you in whenever you're willing to listen. But how many times, and I've seen this even on Facebook this past week, man, some people on there having their theological discussions, talking about a bunch of senseless stuff, making a big deal out of things that shouldn't be a big deal. And, and it's like, man, all you're doing is closing doors. All you're doing is, is shutting people off. That's all you're doing. Oh, you might be right, but you know what? You're not winning people for Jesus. And the fact of the matter is this, is that when we love people to Jesus... When we love people, right, it's God who's going to do the work anyway. It's not you. It's not your fancy argument. It's not your oratory skills. It's not your, you know, personality or your beauty or whatever you think it is. It's God's spirit working in somebody's life. And we are simply there to listen, to love, and to lead them to Jesus. And so today is Palm Sunday. And last night I'm thinking about, oh, God, I'm talking about missions. How does this tie into Palm Sunday? And you're probably saying the same thing. I don't know. We'll see. He says, so, so, you know, we've been talking about missions. We've been focused on this for several weeks. And so many people think wrongly of Jesus. They, they get the wrong impression of Jesus. And back when Jesus was being led into the city, I want you to see this passage, Matthew 21, 1 through 5. It says, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says to you, You shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, and the, the foal of a beast of burden. Jesus came riding in on a donkey. And this is important. And when he came in, he said this, your disciples, go and find this, go and find this donkey, this colt, and bring them with you. And if, any, if they ask you, what are you doing? All you have to say is the Lord has need of it, and he's going to let you go. I wonder how many of us would be that good with our property. That the Lord has need of it, okay, take it, Lord. That if, that if the Lord had need of you, that you would say, oh, okay, go, I'll go. I'll do whatever God wants me to do because my life is his. That, that so often we're, we're like, well, you know, this guy, like he had a, he had a donkey and a colt. That, 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 look, he could have said, well, why don't you just take one, leave me the other. But no, it's like he took and said, take both, right? Take them. If the Lord has need of it, take it. I want to be part of what God's doing around the world. And you have the opportunity to give, to serve, to live. Does the Lord have need of it? Would you be willing to give whatever God has need of? This passage, it says, Behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey and a colt, the foal of a, a beast of burden. I want you to understand that that's prophecy being fulfilled. Zechariah 9, 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So this is prophecy being fulfilled right now. This is important because Jesus fulfills prophecy. There, there's, there's actually people around the world today who are calling themselves the Savior. They're calling themselves Jesus they're not fulfilling prophecy. This is why it's important for you to know your Bible. You need to study your Bible. You need to know your Bible. Jesus fulfilled prophecy. But look at what it says. It says he came to them mounted on a donkey. You see, when they had war, the triumphal king or conqueror would come in on a horse. And riding in on a horse showed and demonstrated they were the ones that you were now going to serve. They were the ones now who had authority over that place and space. Jesus instead comes riding in on a donkey. What does that mean for us? It means that he was humble. It means that Jesus was coming in peace. So many people feel like God just wants to ruin my life. 
And I'm telling you, if you follow Jesus, what you thought was your life is going to be ruined. He's going to turn it upside down and inside out. Because living for Jesus is an upside down way. But, 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 but look, Jesus is not going to come in just trying to destroy your life. This is what a lot of people think. Oh, God just wants to destroy my life. Actually, Jesus came to give you life and to give you life more abundantly. He comes in riding on a donkey, right, in humble humility. He's serving people around him, and he's saying, I come to you in peace. I come to you in peace. He's come to make peace with you. And today, Jesus wants to make peace with you, and he wants you to make peace with him. Because one day he will come, riding on a horse. It won't be a donkey then. The Bible tells us that he will come on a horse. And there will be a banner, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. The Bible verse goes on and it says, The disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and they put on them their coats, cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This is why we distributed to you different palm branches today, because that's why we call it Palm Sunday. It's on this particular day in history that they were ushering in Jesus, and they were waving these branches, and they were throwing down their cloaks, and they were saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Do you know what Hosanna means? Hmm? Yep, thank you, Miss Rose. But it doesn't just mean save. It means save now. Save now. When they're saying Hosanna, Hosanna, they're saying save us now. Save us now. And you see, when they saw Jesus coming in, they were thinking, here comes the political ruler. He's going to take over. He's going to overthrow everything now. They had it wrong. Jesus was going to overthrow in a different way. He was going to save, just not the way they thought. And so today, maybe you need to say, Hosanna, save me now, Jesus. Save me now. Because now is the only time you have. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you can still have breath in your lungs to cry out, Hosanna in the highest. Save me now, Jesus. This is taken from Psalm 118, 25, and 26. It says, Lord, save us. Lord, please grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. Now, if you haven't been in our family groups, you don't know that we've been studying the book of Matthew and the Beatitudes. And those of you who are familiar with the Beatitudes know that it starts out with the word blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who, um, blessed are the meek, for they shall uh, inherit uh, the earth. Blessed are the, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's what we just looked at this past week. For they shall be filled. What does the word blessed mean? We've had this discussion many times in our small group, but what, what, what do you think the word blessed means? Happy? What? Highly favored? Okay. So I, I'm, I'm doing this word study, right? And I'm looking things up, preparing for this message, and, and, and in, the, in the scriptures, the word blessed means to speak well of or to praise. And so when they're saying, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name of the Lord, what they're saying is we're praising your name. We're lifting your name up. We're lifting up the Lord because of who he is, not just what he's done. Listen, there are a lot of things that our church has that, that God has done for us that we can praise him for. But we also need to praise Jesus for who he is, not just for what he's done. Right? Right? And so often, people just want to praise God because, oh, well, he did this for me. Well, it's not just what he does for you. It's who he is. That's what makes him worthy of praise because of who he is. And so, whenever we praise God, we're not just saying, thank you, Jesus. We're saying, this is who you are. 
You are the omnipotent God. You are the omniscient God. You are the almighty. You are the savior. You are all of these things and more. Well, one interesting thing as I close, band, you guys can come on up, is that, um, you know, one of, the, one of the great things about being able to, to share sermons and preach is that I have to study some too, right? <laughs> and so when I'm, when I'm studying and preparing for this, uh, I'm looking up this word in the Greek, you know, what does it mean to be blessed and, and how, how is this in context and all, all these things. And I looked it up and, and here's the Greek. I'm, I'm not going to attempt to say it for you, even though I did take one class of Greek. Um, it does mean to speak well of or praise. So, so when we say, blessed be the name of the Lord, we're saying, yes, praise your name, blessed be the name. But this is the, this is the crazy thing about this, is that the word there, E-U, which is those first two letters, it means good, okay, good. And then the last letters there, is the Greek word or the derivation of the Greek word logos. What does logos mean? Word. So it's saying good word. It's saying when we say blessed be the name of the Lord, we're saying good words to God. We're saying good words about God. But this word actually, we get a specific word about this in the English language. And this word is called eulogy. The word eulogo here, or eulogon, we get our word eulogy from this word. When do we give a eulogy? At a funeral. I want you to think about this for a second. And you see how this ties together. They're here giving a eulogy to Jesus as he's coming into town. And they don't realize that he's about to die in six days. They're giving his eulogy before he dies. So often we wait and say our kind words after somebody's passed. We need to say those words before. And this is what they're doing on Palm Sunday. They're giving their eulogy before. And they're saying, blessed be the name of the Lord. They don't even know what they're saying, really. They don't know that they're eulogizing Jesus. But that's what they're doing. And today... I want you to understand that Jesus did die 2,000 years ago on a cross. And he died for your sin, for my sin, that we could have everlasting life. And today, the best way that you could utilize, utilize Jesus would be to say, save me now, Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You are my Savior. You are my God. And today... I submit myself to you. Would you bow your heads in prayer? I don't know where you are in your relationship with God, but I have to believe that in some way, God may have spoken to you today. And your first step to being a part of God's mission is to understand that you are God's mission. That the whole reason Jesus came to this earth was so that you might not perish but that you could have everlasting life. And that today, you could become part of God's greater mission by saying yes to Him as your Savior. By saying yes to Him. By eulogizing Him and saying, Blessed be the name of the Lord. The one who saves, saves now. And so right there where you're seated, let me encourage you, if you don't know Jesus, to just simply reach out to Him because he's reaching out to you. That in your chair right there, you could say, Lord, save me now. Save me from myself. Save me from death. And give me your life. Give me your mission that my life would have meaning and purpose, not just for today, but for eternity. Christian, maybe you're here and you've sensed that God is challenging you and burdening you to live for something greater than what you've been living for. And there's nothing wrong with having a nice house or a nice car or retirement even. But maybe God wants you to do something differently with your car or with your house or with your retirement. 
that God might want you to invest these things and use these things to further his kingdom. So maybe you simply need to surrender these things, these possessions, unto the Lord. God, here it is. Use my house however you want. Here it is. Use my car however it is, however you want. God, my retirement. Lord, I, I, I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm not a citizen of this earth. I'm an ambassador. So God, use my resources. Use everything that you've given to me for your honor and your glory. Father God, you see our hearts. You know what's happening. And I pray that, Lord, today, however it is and, and, and whatever it is that people need to respond to, that they would be obedient to you. Thank you, Lord, for coming on a donkey to make peace with us. And I pray today that we would make peace with you. In Jesus' name. Thank you for listening. To learn more about us, please visit our website at newvisionc.com and our socials at New Vision Church and NVC Next Gen. Just look for the round broken V logo and we'll see you soon. God bless.